Welcome to the Q Podcast. Q is about conversation. If we're really concerned about ending poverty, we've got to be more concerned about creating justice. Our cultural products as Christians need to both defy and resonate with the culture. And God's doing amazing things. His church is expanding, his church is growing. It's not what's the purpose of my life, it's what is the purpose that's been assigned. Stay curious, think well, advance good. This is Q. I'm Gabe Lyons. Welcome to another edition of the Q Podcast, and I hope your September is kicking off well. I know it feels like fall is in the air here in Tennessee, so it's a great time. And, you know, as we head into the next couple of months, I wanted to have a conversation with somebody who's been deep in the weeds of American history. You know, there's a lot of discussion these days about America's history, the good, the bad, the ugly, the different figures that have been celebrated and uh, even statues built in their name, and a lot of confusion about how should we think about that? What What is the good that's come from the foundings of America? Where have we gotten some things wrong? And how do we think well about that? And so we've invited today Pat Murdoch, who's in a really unique role because he's a curator of a museum. And you might wonder, well, what, what is a curator of a museum? How's it going to help us think about that? Well, the, the museum he's building, it's a $60 million project in the heart of Philadelphia. It's going to be open next May, 2021. Uh, and, and the name of it's called the Faith and Liberty Discovery Center. It's something that our friends at American Bible Society have helped lead and fund. They've been working on it for five years. But I knew Pat could help us better understand from all of his learnings these last five years and what they're creating and the stories they're going to be telling. How do we think well about this idea of faith, liberty, American culture, virtues, scripture? How does all this play together? And so in just a moment, you're going to hear from Pat. Before we do, I want to remind you that we just released... Back on September 2nd, our Church and State Q session. It's exclusively available on Q Media, an amazing conversation. Ten different leaders, all focused on this conversation around biblical conviction or government restrictions. And it was an amazing conversation. We had multiple voices. There was disagreement, debate, a lot of history. We had Oz Guinness with us talking about the history of this idea of freedom of worship, all the way to John MacArthur talking about why we should disobey, why churches should just go back, and no matter what their government's saying, all the way to people like Andy Stanley saying, no, we need to work with our governments and not do that. So there was a lot of debate, a lot of different opinions, but I'll say over the course of two hours and watching these 10 nine-minute conversations, you and your team, if you have a church that you're leading or just your family, I think will be so enlightened to how we can think well about this particular fall and this particular moment. So you can learn more about that at qideas.org slash state. Or if you're a Q Media subscriber, which I know many of you are, go into Q Media. You'll see it. It's it's our featured content right now at, at the top. And so check it out, watch it, carve out some time, and enjoy that. Now let's go in and let's listen to Vice President of the American Bible Society's Faith and Liberty Initiative, Pat Murdoch. Pat, it is so good to have you with us here on the Q Podcast and to talk about something that I just think is so important and couldn't be more important, really, in the timing that we're in in America. You know, here in September, we're at a place where a lot of people are are really trying to understand the history of America, where we're going, how much as Christians, at least, faith is a part of the story, is a part of playing into like this future. Um, tell tell me why, for you, you got involved in this kind of work and why this conversation is so important to you. Yeah, that's a great question. So about five and a half years ago, I got a call from the American Bible Society and I got to know the president, Roy Peterson, at the time. And he said, we have this opportunity in Philadelphia. Would you come and uh, lead this project? And and then it was a it was really a process of discovery. We, you know, we after 199 years uh, in New York City, ABS had relocated to the birthplace of America, and we found ourselves right in the middle of the most historic square mile in the history of our country, Independence Mall, uh, with an opportunity and a cultural moment when um, our country fear, seems to be drifting from some of its core values many of them that were inspired to come from scripture. And also during a time when many Americans are not engaging with scripture. In fact, two thirds of non-believing millennials have never opened the Bible one time. And so that's our, our moment, our opportunity. <clears throat> and so 
I said yes. We moved our family from Charlotte, North Carolina to Grady, Philly, and began the process of crafting a vision, mission, objectives, and what's now become the Faith and Liberty Discovery Center, which is in construction now and scheduled to open May 1st of 2021. Yeah, so the American Bible Society, I know when we lived in New York, they were a big part of just a lot of what uh, we did in New York. I remember partnering uh, to do some of our Q events out of their facility and uh, all, you know, I always just love the history of the American Bible Society. When you go back 200 years and on any institution that was created with a mission and you see that it's still going, that's always compelling. But this does seem like it's been a new move. So not only they moved from New York to Philadelphia, but this decision to actually create space there on, on the independence area to educate people on the script, scripture's role in America's founding. And, and I think that's a debated topic now. Are we a Christian nation? Um, and, and you can hear a lot of perspectives on that. But but Pat, from your perspective and the way that you're approaching this project, what is the perspective you're wanting people to experience when they come and, and actually visit this center that I realize will be a, available, right, next year? It'll, it'll be open? Yeah, we're <clears throat> we're uh, right in the middle of construction, and May first will be our grand opening day. And you know, we're certainly not here to say that all the founders of our country were Christian. That would not be true. But some of the things that we found as we leaned into our research is that um, you know the, the 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 founders, men and women. Were, were deeply influenced and inspired by Scripture. Whether they believed or not, they knew the Scripture backwards and forwards. It's how they learned to read and write. It was the moral grammar of the day, and it helped to undergird these, um, this idea called, called America. And, and, that's, and, and we also know that Scripture haven't, hasn't always been used in the right way during the course of our history. It's, it's a messy story. Um, but scripture has, and the values have played a role. And so what we hope, I think, is that, that people will learn about this new dimension of the American story and maybe somehow kind of understand some of the why behind what happened. And then think well about what can we learn about the mistakes, but also the good that scripture has inspired throughout the course of our country and, and its relevancy for today. Yeah, I think that does become the debatable topic. There's been a, you know, one narrative that just says, hey, all the founders were Christians. Clearly, this was a Christian nation. You know, when you dig into it, there's so much complexity to that statement and, and a lot of nuance, because certainly, as you said, most of these men would have been very aware of Christian ideas, biblical principles, morality. It would have been a textbook in a lot of ways for how to live a good life. Um, and yet not all of them would be, you know, evangelical Christians the way that might be described today, uh, in sort of how they viewed God. And yet it still created this American experiment that is unlike anything else that's ever been in the world. And, and to this date, I think the numbers like 194 other nations have built their constitutions off of some of what we created, you know, two, 200, 300 years ago. That's right. In fact, you know, just a stone's throw from where we're building the center is the National Constitution Center on one end. On the other end is the Independence Hall where the Declaration of Independence was debated and, and uh, written and, and uh, put into to play. And one of the things we did early on that was we thought was kind of interesting was to look into each of the three documents of so the Declaration, the Constitution, and the Bible, and to f- find values that they shared, that these documents shared. And we actually landed on these six values of uh, faith, liberty, justice, unity, hope, and love. And these be, become the themes of each of the galleries inside of the center. And when we talk about these values, we see faith, for example, is not just a re- about religious faith but a confidence in the prospects for a better world. And that liberty, another shared value is, you know, understanding the responsibility and duty to choose what is just and to do the right thing, whether it was around religious, political, civil, or economic liberty. And uh, that these form building blocks for our nations that still guide us today. The other values of justice, 
you know, thinking about rendering what is right and due to another. Uh, unity, the idea of solidarity, that we're all brothers and sisters in the same human family. Hope, of course, hope is what we hold on to with our faith, but it's also important to have through life's inevitable storms, whether you believe or not. And love, the final being the greatest of all virtues, that idea of giving oneself for the sake of others, being other-centered, not self-centered. And I, I see, and I think you would agree, that these values still serve an important uh, role and anchor for any of our lives, whether we are men or women of faith or not. Yeah, I mean, what a great way to break that down. I love that that's how you're actually designing the building is to just help people experience those different virtues, essentially, because all those are virtues and, and values that, whether you're a Christian or not, you're thankful that you have a space where that's true. And and I know in our country today, there's a big debate about, you know, is our country a good country, a bad country? What's our history? And, and in these political times, that really ramps up. But most would agree there's no other country like it where you could truly confront evils, where you could you could actually have the space to push back on things that we've gotten wrong and that maybe the founders didn't understand or, or do right at that time. Uh, and, and all of that's kind of baked into this idea of justice and a society that's going to value hope and faith and love and unity. Uh, so that's just a great message. So tell, tell me for you personally, like what, what was one of the most exciting findings? I mean, as, as you're, you know, I, I love talking to people who curate museums and who are responsible for telling stories because you've really become an amazing storyteller. What, what, what was one or two of those stories for you that you just found in, incredibly compelling? Yeah, again, <clears throat> for me, some of the things that I found out were, you know, things like uh, what we've just been talking about that, you know, the, the Bible and those values were the moral grammar of the day. Uh, Benjamin Franklin could quote scripture better than most seminary professors today. And why would he do that? And here's a man that, you know, still most historians would say they're not sure if he had ever had a personal faith in Christ, for example. But he could quote scripture. Why would he do that? It's because he knew his audience. And if he wanted to take them somewhere, all he had to do was quote scripture and they immediately were there with him. And the other thing that's been powerful is just to learn the stories of some 22 change makers uh, and how their lives, even though they were certainly not perfect, uh, you know, they, they did some amazing things uh, for, the, for the greater common good. Who are, who are some and, of those people you know, if, that you guys are... You know, we think of uh, Dorothy Day, who gave her life for the poor, Richard Allen, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, Sojourner Truth. Uh, there's, there are Cesar Chavez, whose faith drove him to stand up for workers' rights. And so even though none of these people had arrived, and they're flawed individuals, just like you and I, you know, they were able to be inspired by these values, by Scripture, to fight for religious freedom, to end, help end slavery, to fight for women's suffrage, for public education, medical care. And, and we hope, you know, that people will see, hey, you know, this can inspire us today and, and help us think well about issues of like immigration, which is you know, certainly a hot topic uh, in, in these days. But we can just look back in our history and say, what do we learn from both the good and the bad that can guide us um, through the, the noise of today and, the, and these uh, well, big conflicts? And when you look at the 22 stories you're, you're telling of some of the figures you mentioned, I think Abraham Lincoln's one as well that you'll, you'll be talking about there. But, but Scripture just played this outsized role in their life, right? In the way that they would approach having that true compass, that, that compass that would let them know where is the moral high ground there. It was this role that Scripture was playing in their own life, their memorization, their recognition that this is actually an authority in my life that's going to guide how I lead our country in this particular moment. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. And, and the thing I think we have to remember is that None of, these, none of these men and women were perfect, and they were works in progress. I mean, their lives were being formed and shaped, and their, their mindset was being changed. I mean, when they, when they wrote that, that all men were created equal, you know, 
okay, if, if that's what we say and that's what we know the scripture says, how does that form then what we do and how does it change my perspective and my life and, and the things that I did? I mean, we see some of the founders who were slave owners that eventually became leaders in the abolition movement. And we, we can see the connections with scripture and what motivated them. And, you know, and, and I think we, we, forget, we forget that sometimes today. We're looking for, I think, maybe perfection in each other, but we're not going to find that. And, and, um, and so, so how do we wrestle with that? How do we learn from the, the, the bad way Scripture was used? But then how do we hold on to those things that really guided us to a better place? And we have certainly a lot of things to still work through as a nation. Um, and I hope, I hope also, too, that people will see some of the humility uh, that in, in these individuals uh, and, the, and the sacrifices that they've made um, to, to serve the, the greater good. And I think they're, they're very inspiring, but they're flawed. Sure. You know, we hope to show humanity in all of its messiness. And it's hope. Well, and wouldn't that be true? And I think that's, be true of Scripture, right? That yeah. true of Scripture understands the infallibility of man and and our propensity to do evil and to to sin, and also our propensity for good. And obviously, when you share in those stories, that's that's always a part of us looking back in history is recognizing that both did exist in in each person you're going to look at, as well as in each of us. Um, as you think about the opening next May. I mean, give us a sense. So many people listening to this haven't been to Philadelphia. They haven't been on a vacation. They haven't been anywhere. They've been they've been watching digital versions of museums and you know trying to experience other other. Uh, I know some people who uh, uh, a, fr- a friend of ours who was creating field trips for their children to to cities all around the world using Apple TV and some some video programming. And every night they were they were experiencing a different culture. Right. Well. Finally, in May, we hope we'll be at a place where people are able to freely visit and come experience what you're creating. But give people a little taste of what is that experience like? I, I, I know you guys have invested a lot in this experience, and you did bring in some of the best at, at understanding how to build museums and experiences. Because when you build a museum, I mean, you're, you, you're thinking like a hundred-year horizon here. You're not thinking about a pop-up shop. So talk, talk to us a little bit about how you've designed it uh, for the long haul and what people might experience there. Yeah, no, it's great. Um, so proud of the team. And this is a $60 million effort. So we're not going at this half-heartedly. And we have uh, partnered with local projects. Local projects is considered one of the most innovative exhibit and design uh, organizations in the world today. Forbes magazine wrote an article last March about them building the museums of the future, and we've become their marquee project right in the middle of historic Philadelphia's Independence Mall. And even a key technologist uh, a couple weeks ago said that when we open in May, we'll be the most technologically advanced museum in the world. And so (laughs) what's inspiring these really bold statements? And so some of the things I think that'll be different than other museums uh, is that a lot of museums are really artifact heavy and have a little bit of media. And some would say some museums are 90% artifacts, 10% media. And so we're going to turn the museum world on its head. Our experience is going to be 90% media and 10% artifacts because that's how the modern visitor, that's what they want today. That's how our culture is learning through media. And then museums have always struggled with how to get visitors to re-engage with the content after their visit. So as you enter the Discovery Center, everyone's going to get a handheld lamp placed into their hands. And as they walk through our six galleries and our 40,000 square feet of space, if they see things that resonate with them, they just simply touch their lamp to it. And every time they do that, they're collecting it digitally and adding it to their own personalized website that they're creating all along the way. This is, allows us to go home with virtually everyone and to continue that discussion and dialogue and that journey as they self-discover new things and they dig in deeper with things that resonate with them. And because we're creating this basically a massive digital platform that's disguised as a museum, it's going to be highly updatable as we continue to learn from a continuous feedback loop from all of our visitors 
while they're with us and post visit. Right, man, that's that's phenomenal. Some of the other things that are kind of kind of interesting, Gabe, is uh, we're going to have one of the first interactive gift stores where you can dock your lamp and you can sort of have a maker space to t- make one off creations from things that resonated just for you. We're going to launch a Faith and Liberty Bible with 300 stories that connect historical figures with scripture throughout the history of our country. There's a digital Faith and Liberty Trail ecosystem that we're building with a companion side and an in-market app through a company called Super Friendly that will guide visitors wherever they are in the city of Philadelphia to find the Faith and Liberty narrative and also to find where the best cheesesteaks are and where restrooms are and other attractions we that this will see will be seen as a good neighbor and where all boats rise, but we also are planning to tap into strategically, you know, this uh, technology that gives us another layer even beyond the center to invite people in. Um, and we have a bunch of aspirational goals too. We we hope one day to see mobilized a biblical change makers social movement across our country that people will be inspired by the change makers because they, they see in the center and or online through digital, and that motivates them to be to be a change maker in their own neighborhood and community, and hopefully see a a, a better a better America one day, um, as as more and more people get involved and inspired and engaged with scripture. Well, that's wonderful, and I I love the innovation. I love that you're doing it with complete excellence. The investment you guys are making into this is just enormous uh is is i'm assuming this is going to be used by children i mean there's going to be this is a family experience field trips i mean when people are coming to philadelphia this is going to now become part of the discussion whereas before this this likely was missing from the conversation yeah, absolutely we hope to 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 invite uh teachers uh pastors leaders groups uh, we're creating curriculum that will, will come out of this space, uh, digital experiences, lectures, um, all kinds of things beyond the center itself. But, yeah, we've really designed this for kind of 13 and up. Uh, that's what our research says of the 4.8 million unique brand new visitors every year coming to the mall, coming to learn about history. It tends to be 13 and up. Um, single uh, adults, adults without children, and then full families with you know, the moms and, and women really driving the way of, of uh, hey, this is a, an important visit for our family. And um, so we're, we're super excited. We're, we're finding a lot of uh, big partners along the way, too, that are where this is really resonating. And, and uh, we're very, very excited to, to bring this to our nation. And and um, we hope that God will use it to make a difference. Well, congratulations on leading this project, as you said, you know, that began five years ago for you. These types of things, when you're creating culture like this, you're creating a space and a, a real estate location and a, a prominent institutional contribution that takes so many years. It takes a lot of time. A lot of us don't have patience for that kind of work, and you've had patience. And I know you can't wait for those doors to open, for the ribbon to be cut. I can't wait to be in Philadelphia after this is there and just experience it myself. So thank you for your leadership on this, and we're, we're, we'll be excited to continue to learn how it develops as we get close to opening day. Hey, we're, we're excited to tell the story, and thank you for uh, letting us get this story out to your listeners. And Gabe, please let me know when you're coming. We would love to host you and anyone that you want to bring with you. We're we're also very excited. This has been an amazing team effort. And so we're also thankful for everyone that's come alongside us in this. And we think it's not by accident this is happening during this cultural moment. And so there's a heaviness too. There's a, a sense of great responsibility to do this well and to do it with excellence. So pray for us. And um, again, www.faithandliberty.org if you want to learn more. And certainly uh, any of your listeners could reach out to me if they, they want to discuss this at all. But thanks for the role you're, you're playing, Gabe, and you've played for many years. And i um, so excited to be able to share this story with you. Well, thank you, Pat. I don't know if you guys are booking your vacations yet, but I know next time I'm headed north or I'm going to be in the Philly area or New York, I'm going to take the train down because I really want to see everything that Pat's talking about. What I love that he described for us are just this understanding of these six different values, faith, liberty, hope, justice, love, and unity. 
You know, these are ideas that we as Americans, whether you're a Christian or not, we can all agree on. These are these are the actual ideas that they're like fruits of the spirit, and they they bring people together, and we can all agree these are good things. You might disagree with how you play out liberty or how we might go about doing justice, but we can't argue that these are principles that were at the base of of America being created that now allow for those kind of conversations. So I'm excited to see how they're playing this out. Um, go to their website if you want to learn more. You can actually see some of their stories that we were talking about from some of these historical figures by going to faithandliberty.org. I hope you'll check that out and be encouraged by it. And just a reminder, Church and State, our Q session event, two hours, 10 different voices talking about our current moment, this conflict between biblical conviction and government restriction, and how do we think well about it. You can access that as a Q Media subscriber for only $7.99 a month by going to qideas.org state. I hope you'll join in on that conversation as well, and we hope you have a great week. 